Greetings and welcome to our webinar titled AI in Academia, Transforming Teaching and Learning in the Digital Era. I'm Connie Book, president of Elon University in North Carolina. We're really glad that you've taken time this afternoon to join us for what I'm sure is going to be a great discussion about artificial intelligence. I'm currently also serving as the chair of the National Association of Independent Colleges and Universities, so I, I'm hoping to see a lot of folks from that sector joining us today. Today's webinar is an initiative of Elon University's Imagining the Digital Future Center. It's a new center, but it has a long history. Uh, the center was previously known for more than 20 years as Imagining the Internet Center. It was born in 2000, and in partnership with Pew Research Center, Elon faculty, students, and staff have completed nearly 50 research reports, along with thousands of interviews on the impact and the future of digital technologies. Last month, we launched our 2.0 version of that center called the New Imagining the Digital Future Center under the leadership of Lee Rainey, who recently uh, retired after a distinguished 24-year career leading internet and technology research at Pew. We're thrilled that he had agreed to be the director of our 2.0 version of the center uh, it does have an expanded scope of research, and Lee joins us today for our discussion, along with three other panelists who have a great deal to share about the impact of artificial intelligence and what they're seeing out there uh, about its impact on higher education. So I'm excited about this. With us are Ethan Mollick, the Ralph J. Roberts Distinguished Faculty Scholar at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. Udo Sklavo, Vice President of Applied AI and Modeling R&D at the SAS Institute based in Cary, North Carolina. And Hoda Mustafa, who directs the Center for Learning and Teaching at the American University in Cairo, Egypt. Dr. Mustafa is at the center of that university's many initiatives related to AI. Welcome to all of you. And as we begin our discussion, uh, I'm going to ask members of the audience who've joined us that uh, they use the Zoom Q&A function today. We're, we're going to have a few kickoff questions and then we're going to toss it. We want to hear from you about what questions you have uh, and we'll try to reserve time at the end to address those questions. So let's begin with Dr. Malik, who has become one of the most prominent voices on AI in higher education. Uh, he is in the circles. He, all of us are reading his popular One Useful Thing blog, which uh, has taught me a lot about the importance of prompt engineering. Uh, it's called One Useful Thing. He's got more useful things now. Uh, Ethan, uh, the faculty members and administrators around the world are watching what you have to say and um, helping us make sense as the technology unfolds. Uh, I know it's been a meteoric rise of AI in many different applications, and everyone's asking a lot of questions. I'm curious how, uh, I want you to kick us off with how your own thinking has evolved uh, over the last 16 months and uh, share some aha moments with us. Yeah, that's a great question. Let me give you, let me give you a few and a beautiful introduction. Let me try and give you in my typical kind of fast talking way, uh, three uh, sort of aha moments. All right. So the first one was the initial aha moment. I've been playing with AI for a long time. I am not technical. I'm AI adjacent. So I worked with the media lab with Marvin Minsky, who's one of the fathers of AI, but I was like the talk about AI person and not the coding AI person. Um, and so we, you know, so I've been through this process of, of working on, you know, on AI stuff for a while. And when ChatGPT came out, I realized something really weird had happened. The next day or two days later, I taught my undergrad entrepreneurship class, introduced chat to them. By the end of the first class, my students stopped paying attention about 10 minutes in. By the end of the first class, one of my undergrads had actually built working software that he said would have taken multiple days to do. Posted on Twitter, he had venture capitalists offering him, um, you know, uh, meetings the next day. 
So that was like, okay, this is this is a big deal. And then by the Thursday, everyone had used AI for something. Cheating, obviously, but also getting tutoring advice, helping them with ideas. So that was thing number one. Um, the second kind of, um, you know, uh, of revelation, I think, actually came when I started talking to the AI companies. And I think it's really important to realize something. They have no idea what they're doing in our world. Um, they don't, no one really knows how this works. There's no instruction manual that's secretly out there. Nobody actually knows how good these systems are going to get. There's uh, strong divisions in people's minds between how good AI is going to get and how far we have left to go and um, how quickly things are going to improve. But they weren't thinking of education at all when they released ChatGPT. They didn't realize they created a universal cheating tool and the universal tutor in one. And so I talked to these AI companies and they don't understand what they're doing. Like they're not focused on it. There's They think about coding, they think about other stuff which is both empowering and terrifying, right? Empowering because it means you as educators can figure out how to use this best. And I think this is greatly empowering. It's ed tech in our own hands, but it's also a little bit terrifying because there isn't a greater authority to go to. Nobody's regulating this. Nobody knows what it's good or bad at. There's nobody who can tell you what the biases are. You have to figure it out yourself. So as educators, we have to think about that. And then the third piece of revelation was I went viral early on with the syllabus where I required AI use in my class. And that was great because I held people accountable for their AI work. If for free chat GPT, that worked fine, GPT 3.5. When GPT 4 came out, it performed better than my undergrads, right? And like, I'm, you know, Wharton's a good school or got good people. Like, I can't find the errors anymore. So it stopped being useful for me to say, use chat all you want. You're just responsible for the outcomes because I can't, that their outcomes are better with them not doing any work. So the learning just disappeared. So we have to adapt and in, as these systems get better, we have to adapt in deeper ways than just use it, don't use it. We have to be thinking hard about this because no one's doing the thinking for us. One of the things that you shared uh, that really made an impression on me was the fact that the disruption was happening at the top of the um, at the top versus the bottom that, you know, steam engines. Uh, you know, they helped uh, fuel things faster. I think it's something like 20 percent. Uh, but what you were finding from the studies you were doing um, was that performance was increasing by 40 percent. And it was at the top, uh, you know, that uh, it's interesting when you think about the intellectual disruption that uh, this is is bringing and uh, bringing to us. Very good. Absolutely. And just one thing on that. There's a list of the 1,016 most disrupted jobs, right? Uh, that's been disrupted. Overlaps with AI, which means you use AI. Teaching is basically most of the top 25, right? Business school professors, number 22. So like our fields are going to change, but mostly if we do it right in very positive ways that free us from drudgery and help us be better educators. But again, we have to take a charge of what that means. Very good. Um, Mr. Sclavo. Uh, I want to turn to you. I loved reading your post about AI reality versus myth and the uh, 12 different predictions that uh, from SAS for 2024. And of course, SAS is right in the middle of much of this. And uh, you said that AI will create jobs. So this is a good transition from Ethan. Even though you said there's going to be short-term disruptions in the job market. So when you take those predictions and you think about the work of universities, what what advice do you have for college faculty prepping students uh, for their careers? Uh, how can we keep up as faculty? What what advice do you have for us in the middle of this and and preparing students for a, a, a more unknown future in in the job market? Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me on this uh, panel. Um, a very good question, of course, and you know it's it's interesting to probably look back and and see how uh, academia and universities have started, where it was all about um, you know providing general knowledge about the world. So we we specialized only afterwards when we realized it, it's too much to know for a single human brain. You know all these aspects of reality. Um, I think. What I see now with the with the rise of um, large language models and um, AI in general is that we will be forced to tear down walls again between um, disciplines. And uh, in particular, I believe you know while it's probably um, pretty standard to say if you want to work, for a certain company uh, these days, you know, computer skills is is a must. I mean, you can't show up and and be not familiar with how to use a computer. 
I think, you know, being able to use AI technology will become a must eventually as well. So um, I think one of the most important things for us, um, and I include myself because we have to teach internally as well, of course, you know, we have to empower people how to use AI technology in an in a, in appropriate fashion. And of course, it's a fast moving field, right? So we have to make sure that we stay updated. It's not enough to read a book once and then say, well, now I know everything about it. You know, this is a, a fast moving field where we are just tipping our toes into the sea, you know, and it will be curious where uh, this will go going forward. Are you seeing people get better quicker at using it at SAS? Um, it depends on what we are talking about. Um, when it comes to coding, I believe there is a major uh, productivity change we are seeing with the use of um, AI technology for writing code. Um, now, we have to be careful what we are talking about here because there are certain aspects when you write large software packages like ours, which are kind of, you know, boring tasks, right? And those tasks, I think we can happily um, leave to the agents and robots and rather than spending precious human resource time for that. But uh, software architecture, software engineering is still something which the human mind excels in quite a bit. So... Um, the productivity is just changing, if if that makes sense. Yeah, it's a it's a, a little bit to echo Ethan's point about uh, making good use of the human uh, intellect in the middle of the AI phenomenon. You know, what should humans be doing? Yeah, uh, you see, I think where humans, of course, still excel is critical thinking. Um, you know. Um, uh, when it comes to emotions, when it comes to understanding of uh, interactions between humans, the machines are not ready for that. And, you know, of course, we can have a long debate whether there will ever be. And um, But in general, I think, you know, uh, currently we, we see the collaboration between machine and humans is the way forward. Uh, Arthur Brooks, um, Harvard Business School happiness expert, argues in his book, Strength to Strength, that the human strength as we get older, so he's making the point of wisdom, is crystallizing intelligence. And I like this idea of connecting the dots, right, that um, uh, AI could connect the dots, but our lived experience on the meaning is probably a very much a human function on top of it all. <laughs> it's getting as a faculty member, and so we'll transition now uh, to Dr. Hoda Mustafa, you know, as a higher uh, education uh, you know, teaching and thinking about those circles with students when we are trying to drive uh, higher order thinking with them and, and how AI can sit in the middle of this. It's thrilling and daunting at the same time. Uh, I was at a table with a group of students last week as we kicked off the center for the uh, this 2.0 effort around the digital future, and they were faster than me, to be quite honest. I could tell they were faster than me at uh, prompting, like they, their, their prompts, they understood the complexity of AI uh, as a multimodal search engine um, faster than I did. And uh, it, it uh, so it's, it's going to be work for faculty and higher ed in this space. So tell us what you're um, doing at the American University in Cairo, what, what, what leadership you're bringing as you're faced with these new challenges in higher ed and AI. Thank you very much for the invitation tonight in Cairo. And um, I think I'll start with, you know, how we started very quickly, we realized that um, we needed to start having conversations with faculty and with students. So we went through community conversations, introducing AI in teaching and learning. And there was a lot of fear. There was a lot of anxiety. Uh, there was a lot of questioning on, you know, what does this mean to plagiarism? How are we going, you know, what, what is going to happen? And when you have no answers, uh, the best way to do it is to have people actually experience it. We had faculty pressure testing their assessments. We had um, students making suggestions to their faculty. And what's happened since January 2023 to today is the tides have shifted dramatically in our faculty body. So we had um, the ban kind of group versus the embrace group. Uh, and that's shifted completely. I can say um, in most of our disciplines, 
with the exception of writing. Our students are non-native English speakers and writing and learning how to write is very important. Uh, but even our writing instructors are looking at very creative ways of integrating AI and looking at assessment um, in a post-plagiarism world, more of a, a hybrid experience where students are not only using AI, but um, suggesting how to use AI. Uh, we had several student faculty co-design sessions where we looked at um, Elon University's principles and we had them annotate them and discuss them and really give us feedback on those principles. Um, we also had a student faculty panel. Uh, so there are all sorts of things that are happening um, the latest event we had was an assessment hackathon where we had them bring in their assessments and let's hack the assessment by looking at, you know, what are these transform transformative learning outcomes? Uh, we need to change the AACNU essential learning outcomes. I mean, every university will be following a set of essential learning outcomes. We need to question, do these need to change? Um, literacy outcomes, critical AI literacy is coming through very strongly. Um, and more of a uh, enhancing the kinds of outcomes that we know need to be preserved and make sure that some of those skills uh, are not uh, lost uh, in, 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 the, in the process of integrating AI. Um, we talk about responsibility, we bring students into the conversation, and we've had almost half of our faculty body attend at least one of our workshops. Uh, we have AI ambassadors. So we have in every department, we have an AI ambassador who brings the specific concerns that, you know, a journalism ambassador is very different than a mechanical engineering ambassador. Um, so this has been very uh, inspiring for us as a center. Uh, the, the burden has fallen upon Centers for Learning and Teaching to really uh, support the faculty, but also empower them to embrace this as a way to uh, really change the landscape around teaching and learning, which hasn't changed much in the last, I would say, maybe 40 to 50 years. Uh, so this is really an opportune time for all of us. And uh, uh, we're just trying to make sure that everyone benefits and that students are also part of the conversation. One thing that has really struck me is the speed in which change is happening. I mean, even the, you know, think about the speed in which the new vaccines were developed. Uh, think about the speed in which inflation, we experienced inflation, the speed in, in here in the United States, the speed in which we saw interest rates um, being regulated by the uh, feds and increased. Um, uh, so it's, uh, this speed of change is on my mind with AI because uh, I had one faculty member observe that, you know, when the pandemic happened, they had to learn all these new tools, including Zoom, our, our webinar host, right, that they suddenly had to have cameras and audio in the classroom and uh, the speed in which they had to adapt to this new hybrid teaching setting. So do you think higher ed's prepared for this speed? speed of of this the and just think about the change over the last you just described of being naysayers and and nope now they're they're on board uh do you think we can do it um i think we can but we have to change the mindset so something as simple and and i'm, I'm borrowing this term from sarah um uh, Elaine Eaton, the post-plagiarism world something as as central to faculty as plagiarism even our understanding, our acceptance of what this means in a hybrid way of thinking um, is, is, is truly, uh, um, it's, it's just a, it's a paradigm shift. Uh, and we need to work together to do that. I think the community, the entire community needs to have these conversations. This is why we're having a lot of conversations because the more people are talking about it and sharing experiences, if a few writing faculty are sharing how well it worked, um, sharing resources, uh, it kind of invites others to take that risk because they've seen others succeed at it. So I think it's a, it's a community effort. Yeah, very good. I do. I, I think you're right about the risk taking and testing ideas, you know, being willing to um, put ourselves out there in our classes. And we know for faculty being evaluated in those courses for tenure is a challenge to get them to use it as a play space. Um, early in their careers, but that's exactly what we need in this in this environment. So let's turn to our fourth panelist, Lee Rainey. Uh, Lee has just released the first report of the Imagining the Digital Future Center, and it's focused on the impact of AI by 2040. So this this is a uh, Lee. You've heard what the panelists have had to say uh, and share this afternoon. 
Uh, and I know your new study gathered the input of nearly 300 technology experts from around the world, as well as the thoughts of the general public through a national public opinion survey uh, about AI. So from what you've heard today and from the extensive research uh, in that initial study, how can higher education prepare our students and, and the wider society that we work with and our community partners for the impact of artificial intelligence? It was a really fun piece of work to do because we did um, both the public opinion survey and the expert canvassing to get lots of quantitative and qualitative responses. Uh, when we looked at public views about the impact of AI, we looked at two dimensions, what was gonna happen in individual lives and people are, pretty concerned about the impact on privacy and the impact on their social relationships. And they're a little more uh, interested in what might happen to their leisure time. One of the big theories about the rise of AI in people's lives is it's going to free us up for doing lots more uh, interesting things and maybe give us more time to uh, just have to ourselves. And so the public's a little more sanguine about the prospects of that. We also asked about big societal systems and institutions, and we asked about politics and elections, and people are really uh, worried about what AI is going to do to that. Um, we also asked about inequality, and, and both the public and the experts uh, think that the overall uh, the impact on wealth inequality, particularly here in America, is, is going to be severe and not good. And we asked about education systems, and the, and the verdict was a little bit more uh, split, and it was in a kind of fascinating ways. So about a third of the respondents in the public opinion poll said that the negative uh, impact would be greater than the positive. About a quarter said the positive impact would be greater than the negative. About a fifth said the impacts would be equally distributed between positive and negative. And about a fifth said they're not sure. One of the big stories yet to uh, be clarified is uh, how this will play out among people at different levels of awareness, different levels of comfort with these technologies. And so we're picking up a lot of that and people just not knowing where things are heading in the future. When we asked the experts about life in 2040, one of the really striking themes that sort of sets the stage for this conversation about higher education is what uh, experts refer to as adjunct intelligence in, the anchored in artificial intelligence being everywhere and exercising a quite dramatic effect on people's identity and their even their perceptions of reality. Uh, these experts think that humans accustomed uh, to their own agency and uh, humans uh, so far monopoly on complex intelligence, that's gonna have to give way to uh, where AI will essentially be a partner now uh, in both intelligence and consciousness for a lot of the humans. One of our respondents that we quote quite extensively is Barry Chudikoff, who, who referred to this whole uh, shift as a kind of introduction of a mind 2.0 reality, where he argued that thought itself is no longer housed within one brain, but is the end product of a shared brain, where we will want to have artificial intelligence systems helping us acquire both insight and knowledge into the world. He referred to his mind 2.0 uh, insight as uh, a collective mind, an externally accessed mind, uh, which exploits not only individuals, but billions of individuals and institutions and the things that they've learned over time. And uh, it will influence the way we see reality. So for academic institutions, this is enormously challenging and transforming, as you've heard the other panelists uh, talk about. Uh, it's up and down the stack of education, new things are in play. Uh, you know, whole systems of conveying knowledge and inspiring creativity and assessing the learning process and conferring credentials for who has mastered uh, knowledge is all, all up for grabs now in this new world. So, you know, big questions like what is knowledge and what is creativity and what, how, what's valued should we assign to retention and memory and wh what does actually mastery mean in, in these new environments. And so I think that's, um, it's, that's kind of what we're all referring to in this conversation about the implications for higher education. It's interesting to see that uh, people are a little all over the place, uh, not quite sure in that public opinion survey. It's you know, one of the striking things about it was that there was um, quite nuanced opinion depending on the subject. Uh, people had relatively positive or relatively negative uh, views. 
the distribution of positivity and negativity was pretty striking across a whole lot of things. For instance, um, a lot of people think that the improvements in healthcare, again, up and down the, the levels from diagnostics to medicines to public uh, health systems and things like that, they think things are going to uh, turn out in better shape. So it's it's a really interesting moment when people are beginning to figure out some of these impacts and beginning to think that some of, some of it will break good for us and some of it might not break good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of the um, things I'm interested in, I'm going to open this up to anyone who would like to respond, is this the regulatory environment that's being called for by many that, you know, this is a U.S. Uh, 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 invention, let's say that. I don't, it's uh, the U.S. is very much centered in this work and, you um, uh, one of the um, scholars we studied uh, said, we've invented the ship and we've also invented the shipwreck. And we now need to uh, make sure that we're prepared for the shipwrecks through uh, good policy and regulation. So I'm just going to throw it out there. I'm curious, uh, folks' thoughts on the speed of policy that's needed, regulation. What are your thoughts? What are you hearing? I'm happy to start. So SAS is working uh, a lot with customers from regulated industries. So I guess we are used to work in this kind of environments. And that's why it's not a surprise to us that there, there will be regulation needed for AI systems. And um, actually, we have um, created a division inside of SAS, RD, which is actually monitoring what's going on around the world. The EU just released um, a catalog for AI regulation, which we have to follow very closely. Um, the US, um, like you mentioned already, is very active. We are participating in um, consulting the White House on regulatory uh, implications for the industry. Um, I, I think it's not a big surprise, to be honest, because I think every technology eventually needs a, a regulatory uh, framework. Now, of course, we need to be careful not to go too far because we are driven by fear. And this is now where higher education comes in to tear down the walls and basically say, look, this is impressive technology, but it's still technology. Other thoughts on that? One of the ways that this ties to the higher education question is that I think uh, a lot of the energy now being uh, put into conversations about regulation is about stress testing and red teaming and um, otherwise creating adversarial systems to kick the tires on these, on these new tools. And there's great hope, I think, that the academy is going to produce some of the best insights, assuming that the data are shared and assuming that there is a clear enough transparency about what's going on to, to enable that to happen. But it, in many ways, sort of training people to be good um, uh, critics uh, and ask critical questions about this stuff and, and do the kind of testing that uh, Ethan's students are doing is uh, there's, there's great hope invested that that's going to keep us from uh, getting too far off track. One of the uh, observations uh, I'll that was Ethan, you made about the study that was done um, that showed the productivity of an alpha beta test um, on a bo with Boston Consulting Group. Um, and this, that this 40% more intellectual, ex I'm going to call it intellectual excellence, like that AI allowed the test group to perform better at 40% better. And one of the predictions we uh, had in the recent study that uh, the center did was that AI could make us more feeble-minded, that it it would drive the answers. We didn't have to go look for the answers. You know, this fear that, uh, that in fact, we won't use the intellectual capacity uh, that it uh, has uh, replaced that. So what's your reaction to that about getting our brains to actually use the extra time, the extra um, space we have because we weren't doing all of the the, the more uh, fundamental pieces because AI could take care of that for us. Yeah, so um, the study we did at BCG, at Boston Consulting Group, we, we designed 18 tasks that were realistic consulting tasks and the consultants who did those tasks with AI, straight up AI, did 40% 40, 40 improvement performance, higher speed, higher productivity. We also purposely designed one task the AI couldn't do, but it would give 
bad answers to. And uh, that one, people fell asleep at the wheel. They stopped paying attention. They turned in. They were more likely to be inaccurate. Not like hideously. You know, they it went from 70% accuracy to 60%. So it wasn't like a, you know, collapse, but it was worse. And part of the reason people have to learn to use AI is it's impossible to predict in advance if you don't know it, what it's good or bad at. If you ask it to write a 25-word sentence, it will do a terrible job writing a 25-word sentence because it doesn't see words the way we do. If you ask it for a sonnet, it does a reasonably good sonnet, although not amazing, right? But reasonably good in form, at least. Um, by the way, the results that we're finding are pretty universal. So, um, and it's we're starting to get really interesting results from education as well. So my colleagues have been doing, um, there was an experiment that just came out of Ghana showing that AI tutoring significantly improved math skills for K-12 education. There is my colleagues that work in Kenya showing that top performer, a single, you know, uh, who got it, um, entrepreneurs who got advice from the AI had 20% higher profits. So like, this is a universal result. On um, the bigger thing about making us dumber, that's always a problem. So we as educators have to solve it. We addressed calculators in the 1970s by realizing, hey, we need to do a mix of doing math by hand so you know the skill, think of the expertise, and in-class testing and you know band use and doing stuff online. We're going to do the same thing. Education will figure it out, right? There's a clear solution of active learning, flipped classrooms that's interesting and positive. There's clearly going to be – writing is not going to be take-home essays anymore. You're going to be doing a lot more writing in class. Like these are solvable problems. I think the bigger set of crises is actually going to be after graduation because – the way t the way white collar works uh, work works in America is an apprenticeship program where you do basic work until you get good enough because it's delegated to you. No one's going to be delegating basic work to people anymore because they're just going to have the AI do the work for them. And I think that's actually the crisis that we have to use as an opportunity in education to think about what skills do we bring in with the extra time that's higher order thinking. When you know when we when um, spreadsheets were brought into accountancies, it completely changed the way accountants worked because. What they were doing was math by hand before. Now they do high-end advisory work. There will be shifts. Some will be bad. Some will be good. But in education, we're fortunate enough to have some durability in what we do. And I think embracing the positive side and figuring out how do we build expertise for the long term? How do we double down on building expertise? Because that's how you work with AIs. How do we think about taking what's going to be destroyed outside a classroom from learning and bring it in? I think there's playbooks here. We've got a couple of years of chaos ahead of us, but I think we'll, we can figure it out. Yeah, very good one. An economics student told me that um, she was using AI on the census data, um, helping her, whereas it would have been a spreadsheet. So she she talked about the time saved. And I said, well, what'd you do with your extra time? <laughs> you know, and I think that's uh, right. That's where uh, some critical learning is going to happen. Hoda, what, what are you seeing in terms of the nuts and bolts of um, how students and uh, and faculty and as they plan their syllabus, as they're delivering assignments, what are some nuts and bolts about what you're seeing in the teaching space? Well, what I'm seeing here, and I guess this is also universal, is the faculty wanting to have some kind of boundary of use. You know, how how will I allow my students or ban my students uh, to use AI? So uh, faculty are saying, what do I put in my syllabus? So that was one of the first questions and that still emerges and there are huge repositories and people have been contributing and co-creating and, and submitting their, their recommendations. So we're, we're past that. But what I'm seeing now is what do I do over the summer? I want to redesign my course. I want to rethink my assessments. And we're inviting faculty to think about a core question is what do you do with that extra time? You challenge students more. That's kind of our, our base answer to everyone. So to Ethan's point, what kinds of skills do we bring in? Um, maybe we wanna bring in more co-op type, internship type, apprenticeship type experiences, more experiential learning, more community-based learning, more kind of solving for client, challenge-based learning, all of these things. We have a pretty solid tool deck of instructional strategies and pedagogies that we can kind of reshape or rethink uh, to come up with an outcome that is going to hopefully do two things: prevent the the unskilling or the de-skilling or the short you know short circuiting of the essential learning we want to happen, especially in in freshman students, but also to upskill and to bring in new skills, future skills uh, that can really um, let's say prepare students somewhat for the uncertainty and chaos that is going to be happening in these next few years. Uh, there's a lot of concern 
from faculty. I don't think the concern is as much in students. They seem to be more adventurous. They seem to be more curious. Uh, we've had faculty come and say, you know, the students are coming up with ways and they'll come and show me. Oh, I used it uh, to design a rubric for me. I used it uh, to coach me. I, you know, they come up with all, test questions. The students are coming to the faculty with really cool ideas and they're coming to us and saying, my students know more than I do. Can you help? So I think the uh, the challenge piece is important and the uh, leveraging the tools we know that faculty are familiar with to redesign their courses, especially over the summer, so that they come in with more confidence in the fall until the next big disruption happens. And then we deal with that as well. Uh, and T, just what you're saying about the um, continuous improvement the, in assessment, that we could get assessment data in a more formative moment with the student, that yes. there's not the delay uh, so the speed of learning and then putting that new knowledge into action to, you know, is the next is a faster than the week it took to grade and get feedback back, you know, that speeding up that uh, definitely would uh, add time for more depth in learning, right, that you could have more vertical knowledge, um, it's more time with your students as well. Mm -hmm. Really interesting. Well, we do have a couple of questions coming in. So I'm going to read and offer it out to the first question and just whoever would like to respond is that one, uh, the questions is about integrating AI into writing intensive classes uh, to ensure students learn the essential writing and composition skills to articulate their thoughts while leveraging AI, which I know some of the tests say that AI is actually writing things better to, to Ethan's observation, uh, but also maintaining academic integrity uh, and the intentionality around academic integrity. Anybody want to pick up that? I mean, so just to say, I mean, I think we didn't want the essay to die. It was a, it was a, it was a very, you know, it's a useful thing. I do think as people who are concerned about the, the the pedagogy and the nature of teaching and learning, I know as a professor of working in a school, like we assigned essays left and right, assuming that something intellectual happens when you're doing an essay without actually knowing what that thing was or spending a lot of time making it good or sharpening the point. So I think part of this is a challenge for us as like, yes, this is this for the teaching and writing things. I think we're going to have to treat it like math classes. We're going to have to be much more direct about it. There is advantages potentially like cautiously and experimenting with using AI to give feedback in writing. And I know that's a very controversial thing among writing instructors. We're going to have to work a lot of stuff out. You are all on the cutting edge of experimentation as a writing instructor, right? And, um, and we've got to figure that out. And I don't know the answer. I it did, but it's, it's bad, right? The short term is bad. So we have to build a better world out of it. And the way we do that is rethink how writing courses work. What are our pedagogical goals here? How do we rebuild it? More in-class work is clearly clear. Maybe there's AI writing tutors outside of class. Maybe we can convince people that this is important enough they don't cheat. Um, one of the things that I think really weird is cheating was happening already. There's this great study at Rutgers that showed that in 2008, um, people of uh, the kids, students who did their homework, like 80% got higher test scores. By 2018, it was only 20%. And they figured out this is all because everyone was just cheating online anyway. So I think we've also been closing our eyes to 10 years of cheating. There are 20,000 people in Kenya prior to the release of ChatGPT whose full-time job was writing essays for American students. So I think we were a little deluding ourselves about how much things were happening in classrooms versus outside. And I think we're kind of have to stare now open-ended at like, they were willing to cheat. They're going to keep cheating. And so I think we need to think about what we want to do as educators. I think we have to be open-eyed about what this means. And I think this is our chance to redesign around 20 years of new pedagogy research that suggests maybe better ways of teaching and writing. It's not comfortable, but I don't think it's a choice at this point. And I think that that also has some exciting opportunities. I was impressed by uh, Hoda's conversation about how you know, how radically you're pivoting so much more than we are at Penn to thinking about, the, you know, what does it mean to have AI in education, especially as an English second language writer. I've had students come to me and say, I wasn't taken seriously before because I, there's students at Penn who are great writers growing up. I grew up in a, you know, in, in, in a deprived setting. English is my third language and I don't get you know, I don't get attention and now people are interviewing me. So I think there's plus and minuses. I think we have to grapple with that. It's not easy, but we get to make a decision about what it means. That's a really thing to say, to say about writing is that the frame of the creative act itself is much wider now. And so asking good questions is a skill set now that is at a premium and setting the right context for research and questions and things like that. So, the, the, so watching a mind at work, which is essentially what an essay becomes, 
is a process that's a lot more um, queryable now. You can watch how people sort of develop their thoughts, refine their thoughts, extract thoughts from the outputs of the of the tools and things like that. So I think um, in some respects, writing instructors have a, a bigger tool set now to to use as they're teaching their students. I like the playbook terminology. Uh, Hoda, has, have you engaged with a writing faculty member uh, on AI? Oh, <laughs> we've engaged with, all, I think, all of our writing faculty. Uh, we've engaged with them. But um, I think the, I can't remember, I think it was Ethan who said they're on the front line. They really are. We have, for example, English language uh, courses that are uh, pre-college English level. And these students, if they don't learn how to write, well, in that first pre-college year, when they're taking very few other courses and intensive English, they're going to struggle to to handle the level of academic challenge in their other courses. So it's critical for them to build those those language, those writing skills. Um, and if we miss out on that opportunity, there's 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 a threat there. Um, so bringing more writing into the classroom and maybe inviting students to explore, to dip their toes into it. But that's the kind of context where um, you want. You want you don't really want the students, and you need to convince them. One popular, um, it's from the I think the AR Harvard Meta Lab website, the good essay, bad essay, um, where you ask them, okay, generate an essay yourself, and then generate on AI and compare. Uh, we have students like write on a Google Doc, um, correct the AI output on a Google Doc, and see how they can make it better. So they're looking at the sentence structure that came out of the AI, and then they're making it better. So challenging students to do that, but they really need to learn how to write. Uh, faculty are coming up with lots of interesting ideas, and we we have a couple of newsletters where faculty share uh, what they do. So there's a lot of sharing in that writing community within our university. Very good, and it's like that we're all in it together, right? We, so, so it's uh, we need each other in the teaching sector. It's a united front. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, we have another question that uh, is about the pipeline to higher education. So as we think about the K through 12 um, efforts, you know, the, we, we get in higher ed, we see it on the other end of that. So uh, are you working with, have you thought about the K through 12 sector? Are you doing anything there, been prompted um, there? I, I can mention one, we were working with uh, the Relay School, which is, uh, you probably know does, and like what we've actually been building is uh, simulators to help them simulate classroom experiences um, for uh, K through 12 teachers. So you actually teaches you to do an empathy interview and, um, and you know, all. The, so there's a training teachers thing. And then on the K-12 side, again, I think a lot of this stuff does sort of apply and trickle down. But again, we have to, we don't have data. We don't. This is all so new. So one of the things I really would love to make a call for for educators is we need to start working together to better share data and not just as sort of one off exercises. We we need experimentation. I know Sal Khan's doing stuff with with his tutor system. If we get a breakthrough in tutoring, that would be a giant deal. Like there's upsides and downsides to all of this, but I'm worried that we're not doing enough sort of assessment. We're sort of sharing tips back and forth, but we there's not really a, you know, and there's a lot of uh, strong ideological beliefs about whether AI is good or bad in education. I don't think that's helpful either because it's clearly both, right? There are clearly things being lost and things being gained. And we have to acknowledge both those things. But to, I think a lot of people sometimes think they could turn back the clock, like something's going to stop AI. There's, you know, it'll either, you know, maybe these lawsuits will stop. Maybe government policy will stop but AI. You can maybe, wait it out. Yeah, maybe training on its own <laughs> data. Like if we just close our eyes, this will go away. And there's just that's just not going to happen, right? And I think we have to deal with a system that's going to be at PhD level performance on a lot of fields in the relatively near future. I know enough about the future to think we're not done with this yet. Um, and I think we have to be worrying about that and thinking about that a little bit and not pretending this is not happening. You do. Are you hearing from K through 12 sector at SAS? Well, we, we, I mean, our founder, Dr. Goodnight, is very much involved in uh, uh, teaching and K-12, you know, throughout, uh, you know, the levels of education. I think this is where, you know, we are spending a lot of time uh, trying to, help out with our software products um, with these programs and classes to say, you know, how can we give you access early on to complex systems, you know, and basically tear down the barrier of, 
you know, there may be a fear of using these systems, you know, and I think it's it's really important that people start to use uh, environments like an AI um, LLM system, whatever, early on to also understand where the limitations are. And I think the only way you can find this out is by playing with it, you know, without having uh, any constraints about, oh, I have a deliverable, like an essay or whatever, which I have to deliver. But, you know, do this in your free time and you know, ask questions which, you know, are not related to your studies just to get a sense for, well, what, what can these systems actually do? And I think, you know, uh, the sooner we provide our kids with access to the systems, the better it will be. I mean, I will I will happily share. I mean, I'm old enough to admit that, you know, when I was still at school, there was a debate whether we can use pocket calculators in math classes, you know. And of course, it's insane if you think about this now, right? You know, because it's almost like you are covering the eyes of the students, you know, and say, well, do it like we did 50 years ago and never mind what's going on in in. in now and uh, tomorrow. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah. It, and, I, you know, I, we're getting questions about faculty readiness and administrators' ability to make these commitments to give them the time uh, to play with it, to, to adopt your words. Um, and uh, are universities up to the task? And do they have the human resources uh, on the ground that uh, between the teaching responsibilities, the scholarship and the service, to add this to it in terms of their professional development. And you see for even younger people, there's an area which you have a lot of interest in, it may be mangas or comics or music, whatever, start using the AI system and have a chat about that. And then you get a good, you will get a sense of, you know, how valuable is the information which you get? Cause you're an expert yourself, so you can basically decide well, does the system help me here or is it just repeating what I know anyway? I had a chance to have um, a conversation, a group of college presidents this week met with Saul Khan of Khan Academy. And he was walking through Khan Amigo, the AI um, friend, I'll call it the friend, uh, and the use of the, the gathering all of the instructional uh, back and forth uh, in Khan Academy to create um, the, the the Socratic method so that that's they're not giving answers, but you know the ability to get the answer on through tutoring. And I don't know if you've had a chance to explore um, Khan Amigo, uh, but it's it it's definitely makes you aware of the ability of AI to walk us through how we think and to offer from the ecosystem of information, alternative ways to think about what if it's a writing challenge, if it's a math challenge. Um, you know, he demonstrated writing a college essay, uh, admission essay to get into college, which is to uh, Ethan's point, some of the access, uh, lowering the walls on access challenges that people experience um, using AI. So, um, uh, Hodas, I know Hodas told she's lost power, so she's coming back in and she's working out the power situation in Cairo. Uh, but one of the questions that uh, we had come in is related to the smartphone's impact on learning uh, resilience, people's attention spans, and we're seeing the, the research showing the decline in, in attention spans um, and concentrated reading time uh, as a consequence of the smartphone over the last um, decades. And I'm wondering if if any of you have thoughts on learning challenges around AI in this environment of um, student think the way we think and the dedicated time in which we study and produce knowledge. Of course, there's a lot of worry about that and there's a lot of worry about distraction. Uh, which, which is a very close parallel to the smartphone situation. What is striking, though, is the, is the way that you can sketch out a pretty positive scenario that touches on some of the things that have already been mentioned. More instantaneous feedback is a way to stay engaged. 
um, more opportunities to explore subjects or to go in different angles or to consider alternative points of, group, of view is another way to be engaged. Everybody predicts about these tools that as they become personalized in education, in medicine, in leisure and things like that, they're gonna get to know us pretty well. And so the, again, on the upside of this, there's a danger uh, on the privacy side that we're manipulable and steerable and don't know what we don't know. But the upside of it is, is we're more, more closely and better understood, keeping our attention isn't gonna be hard and doing it in a gamified way. I love Udo's uh, use, literally his use of the word of playing with it because there, there's the way that that keeps everybody, especially uh, young folks involved in, in, um, in conversation, in learning circumstances and things like that. Any other thoughts on on the the student we have in the classroom today and their ability to acclimate uh, and how it might impact uh, the way in which they are learning. I have a I have a question that I don't have an answer to, but because we are more mature learners, we already have have some skills that are ingrained in in our in our brains and and we're teaching students that are much younger than us in many instances. Uh, I'm wondering if we can actually um, judge for ourselves. And that's why when Ethan was talking about we need more, we need to experiment, we need to share, we need to assess, we need to understand. Because I don't know if we are able to make that judgment ourselves because we know how to write well. We know how to, you know, we have basic math literacy. Uh, a, a kid in fifth grade, for example, I don't know what's going to happen in the next three, four, 10 years until they come to university. Um, we're using our own lens and our own set of skills to make judgments about students that are much younger. So I love the experimentation. I think there's a huge gap in our understanding. Um, it's very, it's a, it's a very odd time for faculty to be, um, it's very unnerving for us all to have this kind of gap in our understanding and our ability to judge. That is such a great point, Hoda. And if, because I experienced it, as I said, when I was in the round table with the students that they were, they understood it differently than I did based on growing up in a digital world um, and having literally, uh, they were native search engine users. Uh, and so this prompt engineering, they, they could get their arms around that much uh, differently. They, and, and so how do we so how, how do we, so we're in it together almost is what you're saying <laughs> and that the young, the younger uh, users may be our teachers. Uh, so thoughts about Hoda's observation and the question she has about how to, how to maintain our faculty learning position. I have a friend who taught for years at, at Georgetown and um, even pre this version of AI, one of his classroom requirements around which he graded students was how well they taught him something new. And I was struck by uh, Ethan uh, loading all of his academic papers into a, essentially a, a, an Ethan GPT format. And so they can know what you know, and they can know what you're an expert in. And I, why not in this co-creation uh, ethic that, we're, that Hoda's describing, why not require that students um, go to the edge and find new frontiers and bring back something to the collective, not not just the professor, but everybody else that's uh, that's a brand spanking new thing. One of the that's to your point, one of the questions we have is it's kind of thinking about language, the observations about language and culture. I mean, how what's going to happen when we open up the world to each other? And that one student that um, Ethan was describing that international student who struggled to present their ideas suddenly can, you know, can present their ideas and that new knowledge is more rapidly uh, available. So what, what's this future world look like? I mean, we're, we're disruption on top of disruption, right? In some ways, the last uh, 15 years have been what social media and the mobile phone has wrought in the world, right? And we're barely adjusting to that. I mean, I imagine the history books saying, you know, 2008, when the iPhone and, uh, you know, so and Facebook mobile came out through 2038, the great years of disruption or something. I think that's even before AI, right? So, I mean, we'll adjust, but I think that there's a lot of weird stuff that's going to happen. 
I mean, one of the things that was interesting to me is we're all worried about misinformation and we should be the AI can perfectly clone my voice and everything else. But on the other hand, it hasn't seemed to matter very much. You could put up a, a you know video of any politician and write, I cannot believe what they said about you know, murdering every child in it. And we're just going to repost it anyway. So I'm not 100 percent sure that misinformation is not uh, the, 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 the canister is already open there. Right. So I think we're going to have social changes. I don't think we can predict it. I mean, I, the real thing to me is the key question is how good, how fast? And we don't have an answer, right? So if the AI, I think we all our mental model is like, the AI gets a little bit better than today. That has not been the trend that's been happening. The trend has been exponential improvement. The trend has been going from GPT 3.5, which writes like a high school sophomore, to GPT 4, which writes like a first year PhD student. We don't know what the upper limit of these things are. And we should be ready for a world where things even out, but we also should be ready for a world where exponential change continues. And that makes 2040 a much harder thing to predict because I can't tell you what 2037 looks like. And the consensus estimate among computer scientists is that we achieve AGI in the early 2030s with 20% saying we get it in the next two years. I have no idea if they're right or not. I have no insight into that. But I think we should take seriously the idea that education might transform much more radically than we think in the short yeah, to medium yeah. term. Thoughts from the other panelists to that. That's is SAS going to totally change? Um, uh, you know, <laughs> let, let me just pick up the thought um, on, you know, what does that mean for us? And and I I am excited because I believe we are now seeing developments happening which will bring us together as society. I mean. I myself are not a native English speaker and, you know, just the idea of writing, you know, proper emails without many grammatical mistakes is great. You know, it's, you know, you, you are not basically called out by your inability to not read and write in, in a foreign language. And now if you take this a step further and you may have communication in five years time where I could speak in German, which is my native language, and you guys can understand me because there's an in, you know a immediate translation happening. So we can have communications across uh, borders, which will give us you know an opportunity to come together as societies. I believe, of course, as with everything, you know that. There may be downfalls, you know, that all of a sudden we are starting to misuse that technology. But overall, I'm I'm a technology optimist. I always believe that um, you know we will work this out for the greater good, and you know we will wipe out the kinks over time. You know, let me comment also on the the fake images which were uh, mentioned earlier. I think you know it's it's quite interesting to see that these are caught very quickly you know this is not something which will exist out there and people will say well maybe that's the new reality i mean there is still a common understanding a almost like a common knowledge where people will say well that's not real right and then you know those things will be identified now we'll say things become more complicated once we go into the uh, area of what we call synthetic data generation, where all of the sudden the data is no longer an image or a voice, but actual tabular data. I mean, you can't look at data and say, well, this is fake. You know, this is where we as software vendors have to do our job and basically figure out methods and uh, technology, which will help us to identify, you know, that numeric data can be fake as well. Yeah. Any thoughts, Hoda, on that? Future. Future-wise, um, I'm also an optimist, somewhat rational optimist, but an optimist. <laughs> but I, um, I'm very excited to see how the role of faculty is going to change. And even though there is a gap, but how that gap can be closed, I, I hope, very quickly. Um, if if the mindset start to change um, and if uh, faculty start to see students as partners, um, pedagogical partners, assessment, par I mean, partners on every level uh, and will create, I, I hope, a new a new role for faculty that is um, more of a facilitator, coach, uh, guide, uh, you know, colleague even. So it, it, things it, things will hopefully change in that direction, even at some level. Um, and learning, I love the example, the syllabus, what did you teach me? So I think I'm going to bore that one. <laughs> yeah. That's a really great one. 
Very Thank good. You. Lee, any closing thoughts for us? I think that the um, the whole notion of education is going to be reimagined, um, starting with the micro level with micro credentials and, and other kinds of certification and going to the macro level of lifelong learning um, and, in which universities have a have a big edge because they already have alumni relations and sort of striking a deal with somebody at whatever age, 17, 18, 19, 20, 30, and saying, you know, not only are we gonna give you the education you need right now, but we're gonna um, give you a subscription down in the future for our, taking a certain number of courses every five to 10 years, or we're gonna give you a package, like a frequent education flyer package of, you know, you can do these these kinds of things. Now, I think there's a real opportunity to build, you know, learning communities uh, in new ways thanks to thanks to these things. Yeah, it's very, all, all of you said the word exciting <laughs> and disruptive in the remarks. And uh, it's really uh, um, a pivotal time in humanity. I'm excited too. Uh, about all of these new tools and uh, all of the revelations that we're seeing so quickly about the way information um, can, through artificial intelligence, uh, can, I absolutely believe it can bring the world together, as you do told us, uh, in a different way. So I'm excited too. Well, thank you all for being a part of our discussion today. We will be posting a video recording of today's session on the Imagining the Digital Future Center's website. Um, that is at imaginingthedigitalfuture.org. Um, so we will email a link to that to all of our participants and all of those who registered today. Uh, we always want to continue this conversation. So the center is uh, uh, looking for partners, looking for important questions that we can uh, uh, put our heads to and uh, provide answers. And of course, we'll continue um, to uh, watch this unfold and be a regular contributor to forecasting and research about artificial intelligence. Thank you all. Great to be with you this afternoon.